We started using Cas1 relatively early. This has helped us to be more precise in our work, and with ablations, great precision leads to better results. Compared to before when we did everything freehand, we can now check that the treatment was successful right away. We couldn't do that before. First, we perform general anesthesia. That's the consensus in our team, that we don't use deep sedation, but general anesthesia. You can't always predict how long the procedures will last. That's the first reason. The second is that, with some patients, we need respiration apnea longer for the navigation. What always proves difficult, especially in CT compared to surgery, is the positioning of the patient. Everyone has to help. That was a bit difficult at the beginning, but we all learned together and we also asked the surgery department for assistance. That's important because they do this every day. We have positioned the patient at a slight angle since the HCC is located laterally. That's why we put the vacuum mattress underneath. This way everything stays stable during the entire procedure, nothing moves. In the past, when we did it freehand, we were always present when the patient was being positioned. We were always there to say, please position them this way. We had to say which CT scan we wanted every time. Now the workflow we have created is standardized. That means I don't have to come in until the first CT scan is done and everything is set up. It's all relatively standardized now. This also makes it much easier for me both organizationally and in terms of time. It's become easier for the radiographers too. Now they know exactly what the workflow is, what CT scan they need to run, when, and in which order. For example, the planning CT is now standardized. It's the same procedure for every patient. This means the team doesn't have to readjust every day or with every ablation. Instead, they're aware of each step in the ablation process from beginning to end. We have the information in advance about the position in which the patient is to be placed. As soon as we put them into the correct position, we'll get the data record ready. Then we'll do the CT scan. As soon as the CT data record is copied to the castination console, we'll let the radiologist know that they can come and do their planning. If we take a look at the CT scan here, we can see quite clearly that this area is a bit brighter than the liver tissue. That's the recurrent HCC. That's what we're going to ablate during the procedure, from the surface of the skin here on the screen. I estimate that will mean puncturing from here, laterally. I always take a look at the 3D view so I can get an idea of where the puncture site is. Take a quick look at the rib here. We'd be going exactly through the rib. That means we're going to have to penetrate a little more cranially. If you take a look at it again in the 3D view, you can see that we go past the upper edge of the rib with the probe. This means it would be perfect in terms of the needle trajectory. We have the artery here, which lies close to the trajectory and is in the way. We'll have to figure out how to get past that. I had planned to go this way before, but the artery was in the way. So now we will go in one intercostal space further down. That makes a nice window for us here. This view here is extremely helpful. This is the liver and this is the kidney. You can see we're quite close to the lower edge of the liver. That means you can go in from a little further up, more cranially. I like to use the function for automatic tumor detection. The tumor is marked in red, here in this circle. The system has automatically detected it. The yellow line outside is the safety margin. You can set it in advance, exactly as you want. Five millimeters is the minimum you want as a safety margin. Most people would want it to be about a centimeter here. But that is somewhat difficult, given the size, as you can see. That would be a relatively large volume. Now we can simulate it. If I were to ablate at 100 watts for 10 minutes, with the manufacturer set here, the ablation volume would be this area marked in green. I'm capturing the tumor perfectly. 
which is the area marked red. I've even managed to keep to the safety margin. So we would get the entire tumor while maintaining the safety margin and without having to relocate the probe. In other words, the setting is optimal. This means we can now turn our attention to the positioning. I assemble the marker by screwing on these small balls. The next step is to take the arm and position it on the table. We need to think about accessibility. I've set up the arm at a bit of an angle because it's relatively close to the puncture side. I can make it easier for myself if I screw it on at an angle. The next step is to think about the best angle to attach it. I want to locate the needle trajectory somewhat cranially. I'm looking at the angle to see if it works. The fine adjustment knob allows me to fine tune the puncture angle. There is an end point here, which you can't go beyond. This means initially you should make the puncture from a middle position. The middle position is when the two arrows are lined up. Then we have these other two orthogonal arrows here. I also have to put them in the middle position first. From here I have a wide range for varying the angle. I position it here and clamp it firmly. I can see here that I'm correct with the needle trajectory side. I check that I'm about one centimeter away from the patient. And I can still fine tune the position with this fine adjustment mechanism. But for now, I'm happy with the accuracy. There's still quite a lot of movement as the patient breathes. This can be seen from the curve shown at the bottom. You can see how it differs in every breathing cycle, how it goes up and down. This is the breathing cycle you're seeing here. You can see the red dot moving. This is also caused by breathing. That all corresponds to the movement of the patient's stomach. The next thing I need to think about is how long the ablation needle should be. This is now shown on the image on the left, 190 millimeters. I need an ablation needle that's at least 190 millimeters long. This manufacturer makes relatively large round defects. That's an advantage because of the safety margin. If the patient's breathing has been interrupted, it takes a little while until this respiratory center position is reached again. You can't puncture right away, and the CT scan can't be done after a second or two either. We have to wait until everything has calmed down. I have a bit of a deviation on the surface of the skin where I intend to puncture, but that doesn't really matter. I adjust my plan by going to redefine entry. The system is telling me where the skin should be punctured, as I have set the position of the aiming device. I'm making some fine adjustments. It's very important that you don't put tension on it. I insert the ablation needle so that I exert as little tension as possible, and I'm going in the right direction. I put it up against the skin. I'm making a small incision, roughly in the right direction. I have to make sure I don't exert any tension on the probe because as soon as I put a little tension on it, there's danger that the ablation needle will deviate. It's just gone through the liver capsule, and now I'm advancing the ablation needle to 19 centimeters. The ablation needle is 20 centimeters long, so that means the last marking but one. I slacken it off just a bit now. Otherwise, when I let the patient breathe again, the ablation needle may be pulled out. By doing this, I'm loosening it a bit, so the ablation needle can move. Now he can breathe. 
The next step is to do a CT scan. When doing the CT scan, I have to make sure the arm will pass through the gantry of the CT. But that should fit well. I put the laser to the puncture site, which will make it easier for the radiographers. Because then I can say, please go upwards a little from the laser, as I'm about to adjust it now. I'll turn on the laser on the CT. That makes it a whole lot easier. I'd say it looks good, but to see if there's a deviation from the plan compared to the actual position, we can now do this fusion inside the device. Then I can decide whether to correct it by one or two millimeters, or whether I'm satisfied as it is. In the past, when we didn't have a navigation system, you had to imagine all this in your head. This makes it so much easier. The images are sent automatically. This is stored in the CT, so as soon as the images are taken, they are automatically sent here. Now I have to wait for the CT scan to arrive. Here it is. This scan with the probe is now superimposed on the image with the plan that I made at the beginning. I can take a good look. Is there any deviation from the plan? In what direction is the deviation? Is it too great? Do I need to make a correction? Is it still okay? Am I satisfied? Now I can see the needle. This little white bright spot is right on the plan. It's absolutely perfect. Brilliant. I can mark it again quickly here. I see it's positioned perfectly. That's one millimeter of deviation from the original plan at the most. And that's the great thing about it. I would have thought I needed to go in a little further with the ablation needle, but now I can see that I'm actually a bit too deep in the liver. If I look at the green area, that is the ablation defect. The red area is the tumor, the yellow area is my safety margin. So actually I'm a little too deep. It would be best if I retracted six or seven millimeters. Then I would be in the best position to get the entire tumor and still keep a safety margin. I'm retracting the probe by seven millimeters. That was about six or seven millimeters. Now I'm going to ablate at this position. Please set 10 minutes and 100 watts. Okay, now start. For me, ablation is successful when we have completely ablated the tumor, ideally with a safety margin, and if there were no complications during or after the procedure. The probe is heated and slowly withdrawn under ablation. There are two reasons for this. First, you want to avoid seeding tumor cells. And secondly, the risk of bleeding is lower if the small vessels are coagulated as the probe is withdrawn. It is important to stop the ablation in time so that there are no burns to the skin. This dark patch that you see now is the defect. You can see this very bright dot dash at the front. That's a small hepatic artery. That's where we had to check the plan to make sure we wouldn't accidentally go through it. You don't see any residual tumor, just the way it should be. I believe that this system leads to greater precision, and with ablations, great precision leads to better results.